You are a unique individual with the power to change lives just by being who you are, sharing your wisdom and telling your story. Welcome everybody to Jen's Pen Live, where we find interesting people who are making the world a better place and ask them to share their story. Now, if you wanna talk about making the world a better place, you are in for a treat. We have Amy Simpkins with us. She is the co-founder and CEO of the renewable energy startup, New Grid Analytics. Bit of a tongue twister there for me, sorry. Amy is currently focused on creating change in the energy industry um, in support of sustainability, energy equity, and community resilience. Um, her podcast, Power Flow, she, it focuses on the burgeoning energy revolution about time, and uh, it works to amplify the underheard voices of female, non-binary, and BIPOC innovators. And then like she's like a rocket scientist too. Yeah, because she studied aeronautics and astronautics at MIT, just down the road from me. And then she's also a speaker, an author, an adventurer, an innovation catalyst, and a vision architect. We need to hear all about this. Amy, welcome. Thank you so much. It's all true. I, I, <laughs> I have to say, it's all true. Excellent. Good to hear. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for sharing your time with us and, and your story. So let's start off. How did you get to where you are? What's your story? Um, well, once upon a time, um, I grew up in southeastern Michigan um, in one of the outer suburbs of Detroit. And I wanted to be an engineer when I grew up, but I did not want to work on cars. Heaven forbid. <laughs> um, which is actually kind of ironic, but you, because, you know, when you work in the energy industry, um, you know, energy definitely touches transportation. We're seeing electrification of vehicles. And now I'm really <laughs> into cars. cars. <laughs> yeah. Um, but at the time I, I fell in love with the, I, I fell in love with science and engineering in general, but I, I specifically with the idea of space flight. And I said, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to work on. This is what I want to contribute to. You know, I know what my mission and purpose <laughs> in life you know, I, you don't need, I don't need to go through a program. Like I've got it all down. And I, I was one of those annoying people who, who knew when they were 12 or 13 years old, kind of what they were going to do for the rest of their life. So the joke is on me because of <laughs> course I, I've discovered other things that I wanted to do. And so, um, I, yes, I went to MIT. I got my bachelor's degree from MIT in aeronautics and astronautics. And I have a master's degree also and uh, I worked for Lockheed Martin for 10 years, um, doing exactly what I had intended, which was to design, operate, integrate spacecraft. Um, got to work on some Earth observing satellites, some uh, manned spacecraft, some unmanned scientific exploration spacecraft. So if you ever see a picture, those cool new pictures of Jupiter that are yeah. at, like how are at like weird angles, like so all of those are from the Juno spacecraft. And that was the last spacecraft I flew from the ground, because um, it's a robotic unmanned spacecraft. But I, I, I flew it from launch through its early cruise and instrument checkouts and stuff like that with the wow. team. Um, yeah, and so That's it was- pretty damn cool. <laughs> it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty damn cool. And I loved it. And then I wanted to do something else. And it was, it was funny, I was just talking to a, a professional acquaintance the other day who said something so insightful to me that was sometimes you just have to do something different. She had actually, this person I was talking to, she had made the shift from life coaching to energy, to the energy industry. And I said, I was like, what, how did that go? You know, how did that work? Why, how did that come about? And she said, sometimes you just have to do something different. And I was like, wow, that just explains the story of my life in a better way than I've ever been able to articulate it. <laughs> so I got to a point in my career where I really just wanted to try something different. And I got, a, I got bit by the entrepreneurship bug, the idea that I could myself offer something of value to either an individual or to a group of individuals and, you know, was intoxicating because when you work in aerospace, specifically in space flight, you're, you're always a part of a team. It's really, really hard to do something impactful as an individual in the space flight world. You know, it's big teams working on really big projects. And there's a certain beauty in that. 
Um, but I also yearned for something else. I yearned to see, you know, stretch my own personal wings. Um, and so I started casting about for businesses I could start. I wanted to start my own business. And I stumbled into first life coaching, which had its own ups and downs, and then um, business coaching and consulting and helping people to starting their own businesses. And it actually, what I found was that my experience as an engineer was actually perfectly suited for helping people build businesses because building a business is just an exercise in design. Just like, so instead of building a spacecraft, you're building a business and all the same design questions you have to ask about, well, what are the requirements and what are the objectives and how do we make sure we're meeting those objectives with an engineering system? Well, you got to ask those when you're make, building a business too. And I started to draw some of those parallels um, because a, as you know, <laughs> um, entrepreneurship is the best personal development program. You can possibly <laughs> embark on. <Yeah>. So <laughs> Even as I'm helping people build businesses, I was also, you know, having a massive identity crisis <laughs> and building myself, you know, rebuilding yeah. myself, rebuilding who I was um, independent. If I wasn't Amy, the space girl, who actually was I? And I was able to kind of draw parallels between the innovative process, the innovation process that we think of for technology and engineering. And I was like, well, this is just the same process we go through as people, as humans when we're trying to evolve ourselves. Mm. And it's the same process we go through when we're trying to evolve or build a business. And so all of these patterns are the same. And that's when I wrote my book, uh, Spiral, which is called, a, which is Spiral, a catalyst for innovation and expansion, which I still love the title, even though you have no idea what that means. Um, but it's I, intriguing. It gets it, you to it, pick it up. <laughs> it's cool. And it's got a lot of really good words in it. Um, but that's what it's about. It's about draw. It's about using principles from, you know, engineering design to think in a different way about our patterns of personal development and business development. But then it also works the other way too. And you know, as humans, we go through these cycles of development. Nothing is a straight line. And there have been a lot of you know jokes and memes made about how you know the path to success isn't a straight line. And so. Um, my book tries to codify that a little bit more and say, well, there are patterns. It's just, we like to fight the patterns sometimes. <laughs> and the pattern feels uncomfortable. And we think it's chaos, when in reality, it's a very predictable pattern. Um, and can we apply that back actually to technical innovation? Can we say that there is a very natural part of a human creative cycle that is you know, action and implementation and getting things done. And then there is also an, a part of the human creative cycle that is about rest and respite and reflection. And if that is so for human development and human creativity, well, then it should also be so for technological development and, innovate and technical innovation that we don't just push all the time Sometimes you need to stop and pull back and reevaluate and create more space to invite more ideas in instead of just trying to drive all the time for, I don't know what, scalability, profitability, and all of those like really awesome, like hyper masculine words <laughs> that like rest and respite should be part of the technical development process. Hmm. So I'm still in the story part. I told you this was going to be, this I is going to be it. a thing. So my crowning achievement as a business coach was to coach my husband to leave his corporate job, which at the time was at the National Renewable Energy Lab. And he had started to get um, some inquiries about consulting. And he was like, I don't know, should I like, should I try this? Should I build a consulting business? Like, you know, do we think there's a market there, you know, and, and the idea was that people who come to the National Renewable Energy Lab have to bring a lot of dollars to work with mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of overhead. And if my husband could work as a independent consultant, you know, you could get NREL level brain power for smaller dollars for individual consultant dollars. And that was kind of the pitch. And so and, you know, he basically looked at me and said, well, I'm not sure I can do this by myself. 
And I, I did a lot of soul searching and I said, all right, I think we have something here. I think this is something I would like to work on. Let's do this together. And so he and I, um, he is the CTO. I am the CEO and in, in charge of more of like the business execution part. But I also get to use a lot of my engineering, which is kind of surprising because I had, I thought I had walked away from technical, from engineering. And, um, you know, in a small business where you have a small team, everyone wears a lot of hats. And I not only wear the business execution hat and the project management hat and the contracting officer hat, but I also wear the system architect hat. And I do my fair bit of technical work, which is actually pretty fun um, and creative and stuff like that. So the company is called MuGrid, MuGrid Analytics. So the Mu in it is the Greek letter Mu. Mm -hmm. And in science and engineering, the Greek letter Mu stands for micro. Okay. So like if you have like a micrometer in terms of uh, measurement, it's, 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 so a millimeter is, a millimeter is an English M mm -hmm. or Latin M, 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 but a micrometer is the Greek letter mu and then an M, micrometer or micrometer depending on you know, Micro who, micrometer. I like that. Micrometer. <laughs> yeah. And so the, so what new grid means then is microgrid. And so what a microgrid is, is it's a collection of energy assets, generation, storage, distribution, and control that live together and they serve a local load. So if you have a, a small generator on your house that can power your house, when the grid goes down, that's a microgrid. But, you know, we're looking at more complex microgrids, specifically microgrids that involve renewable energy. And so, you know, they might, they most often they involve some solar power for generation. And then, but solar power doesn't work if the sun's not out. And so if you want to use your solar power when the sun is not out, you need to have some kind of storage. And that's storage. usually these days a battery. There are some other storage technologies out there, but for right now, where we are at as an industry, mm -hmm. battery is kind of the front running one. And then often, um, you know, because of kind of the variability of sunlight, a, a facility, especially if it's a critical facility, like a fire station or even a grocery store that needs to keep food, you know, from spoiling, yeah. will need, will want, even if they put some resilient power, uh, resilient solar power and battery storage, and maybe even some wind or something like that, they also want to have some sort of fossil fuel based generator. And actually the funny thing is, is that all three of those, all of those things, renewable generation, storage, and generate fossil fuel based generators actually work together in symbiosis mm -hmm. so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. The, they all help each other to be better. Um, and so that's what we do. We do, um, feasibility studies, we tell uh, sites what they should do, what they should build, how big the things should be, how much money it's going to cost, and then how much money it might save them in their utility costs, because they're going to, you know, generate their own solar power and use the battery to put the energy where they want it. They can do that for economic benefit and save money on their utility bills. So we look at economics. We look at modeling resilience, which is how long you can stay up after the grid goes down. Mm -hmm. um, which, and um, and we're, then we, we come in after the system is built and we can operate those systems the way we modeled them in the first place and say, we said you were gonna be able to get this economic benefit, now let's go do it. And so that's what the company does. And it's been quite a ride over the past um, five years. The company's just about five years old now, and um, it's it's been a wild ride to be in the energy sector at this time. And things are things are really. I think everyone is even even five years ago when we started the company. You know, renewable energy was a little bit of kind of a specialty niche, and I think more and more people are waking up to the idea that this is the future that we need to go here. Exactly. And yes, and and more and more normal people are wanting to know about what's going on in the industry, know what the technology is. I mean, and they're seeing climate change events that are happening that are affecting their people's access to energy. We've got rolling blackouts in California to prevent wildfires, uh, rolling blackouts during extreme heat events because there's just too much demand, power demand for the grid to handle. 
Yeah. You know, we had Texas, which their natural gas plants froze in the winter. And actually, so one of my friends, so I'm in, a, in this group of moms on Facebook. Mm-hmm. We all had our babies about the same time. And all of these women are professional women, very intelligent. And mostly we talk about babies because that's how we, that's how we met. We mostly talk about parenting and, you know, all of that stuff. But one of our members lives in Houston and during the uh, polar vortex event where, you know, all of the power went out in Texas for several days and they had to like pinch to pitch tents in their living room to stay warm and stuff like that. She said, Amy, can you tell me what is happening? And we started a really cool conversation about energy. And some of the people in the group, again, super intelligent, professional women Mm -hmm. were like, I don't even know how I get my, I don't even know where my power comes from. And I don't even know how, wait, my power comes from natural gas. I didn't, I didn't know. And we started this conversation and it made me, it made me sort of realize that like my husband will talk about economics and technology and investing and trends and finance and all of this stuff with his buddies, just as like normal topics of conversation. Mm -hmm. And what do I talk about when I get together with my women friends? We talk about how we're feeling, which is fine. (laughs) It's very important to talk about how you're feeling. And our kids, again, Mm -hmm. very fine. But I'm surrounded by incredibly intelligent professional women who have influence. In fact, the woman who lives in Houston works for one of the big oil companies. Like, and she's, I mean, she, and fairly as a manager, it's like fairly high up in the company, not on the energy side, she's more kind of on the HR side, but, okay. um, but these intelligent professional women, and I'm like, I wanna talk about real stuff because mm-hmm. you start to talk to women about real stuff And all of a sudden we have great ideas and we have a very holistic intersectional way of thinking about problems and solutions. And somewhere out of that mix, the idea for the Powerflow podcast was born. It was always something, it was something that had lurked in my mind for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that conversation was like, I really have to do this. Like, no kidding. Like, we need to have more conversations with women, with non-binary folks, with BIPOC professionals who are experts, who are intelligent, who have amazing, innovative ideas, who are down in the trenches doing the work. And we need to bring these voices out and together to encourage more collaborative conversation about what we can do, not just as an energy industry, although that's really important, but also energy touches everything. Energy touches transportation. It touches food security. It touches community resilience. It touches issues of social justice and social equity, air quality, um, communications, public health, everything. Everything. I I used to say, (laughs) I used to say, I'm not going to exaggerate and say energy touches everything. And since that time, I'm like, no, actually energy does touch everything. Everything. (laughs) And so that was, that was the, um, you know, the motivation, motivating factor behind starting power flow. And it's been such a gift, like to me personally, like having these conversations with these guests, with these diverse voices has given me so many ideas has sparked so much not to mention, and then there's the listeners. <laughs> it's like, you know, you know, it's good when you're the one who's getting all the benefit and you're like, oh, if no one ever listens, that's not a problem. <laughs> right. I got oh, what I, I need. <laughs> so there you go. That is the story. Fantastic. My goodness. There's so much to talk about there. So uh, you and your husband are like literally a power couple, huh? We're... <laughs> 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 Oh, nice. Nice. I love a good uh, nerdy Uh, pun. That's right. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Apart from that. uh, So there's so many questions. All right. When you say innovate innovation catalyst and vision architect, can you talk more about that? Sure. So those terms were born out of my, you know, 
stint in coaching, which I still do on occasion, um, mm -hmm. you know, for the right people, for the right project. Um, but I found that like, I, I myself am not off my, my superpowers in the world are being a pattern finder. I am a pattern person and I am excellent at looking at what other people are doing and saying, oh yeah, you just need to take that and match it up with this thing over here. And now you've got magic. <laughs> I am much less of a generator of ideas myself, even though I am highly passionate about innovation as a discipline, as a practice. I'm, you know, I'm more of the person who puts things together, which why, you know, when I was in spacecraft design, I was working toward the title system architect, spacecraft system architect. And throughout my career, that title architect has stayed with me mm -hmm. no matter what I do. And so, and I'll tell you what that means to me. So you can think of a building architect because that's like normally we associate the word architect with like buildings. Well, what is the, the, the building architect? The building architect is a person who has, they sit at the intersection of art and engineering. Right. right. They need to make sure that the building is functional, that it will serve its purpose and that it will not break and that it will be robust to, and they work with an engineer to do that but the architect is in charge of that big picture thing. Mm -hmm. But also that the building is beautiful, that people love to be in it, mm -hmm. that it makes sense, that it is appealing, that it's comforting, it elicits good emotions, right? And to me, that intersection of art and engineering is firmly where I sit, that I work with other engineers who are really good at technical details, but I'm the one who sees the big picture. And so when I talk about being like an innovation catalyst, it touches on those kinds of ideas that mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily the idea generator, but I can be the idea catalyst. I, there's no other word for it. I was gonna no, say- that's, I get it. Implementer, eh. No, like, definitely. Yeah. I am often the medium through which ideas are able to come into the world. Um, alchemist is another like word that I've played with that like it's a transmuting of right. ideas from like ether, from non-existence to existence. And that's like, it's a pretty magical process actually. You know, I'm a scientist and I'm an engineer, but I'm going to tell you that process is pretty much magic. <laughs> um, and so that's, th that's where, and then, so then vision architect is that idea of like pulling the pieces together for people, for businesses, for concepts, for movements. Um, that's kind of like the core of what my superpower is. And it's been a while, you know, I've, for there have been times in my life where I'm like, this is the thing that I work on, like spacecraft, then this is the thing. But I've come to realize I can kind of do that work for anything. And so I'm, I'm open, I'm excited. Like, what is the next thing I get to work on that is super high impact and also helps me to, you know, work this magic? That's so cool. Like you were talking earlier about um, how you see patterns and, and how they're the same, whether it's like, in business or or aeronaut, uh, aeronautics or you, you can see the overall system where other people see chaos. Right. That is fascinating because I see chaos a lot. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Um, but to be able to sort of see the, the, the bigger pattern and then that that's that's a rare gift. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So what you, you were talking about that there being more of an active cycle and a more restorative or resting cycle in yeah. idea generation in everything. Yeah. Not sure where I'm going with this, but it's so interesting. So if you, if you could give us an example of that in these different areas that you're talking about, whether it's innovating um, or working at an aeronautics or being a, a rocket scientist. I don't even know what the terms are here. 
Um, no, that's cool. Um, so yeah, so, okay, so let's take something really super practical and then I'll make it a little more esoteric. So um, super practically, like think about, think about if you were gonna design a thing to do a job. And, you know, in engineering, we call that a widget. A widget is a generic thing that does a job, <laughs> okay. right? And so say you were gonna design something um, and, and, you know, you're gonna build it. You're gonna go down to your shop with your screwdriver and your hammer and you're gonna, you're gonna put it together, right? Um, so if you're designing something from scratch, first you have to like have the idea of like, and so you think about the problem, right? And you think mm -hmm. about what you want it to look like and what purpose you want it to serve. And then you start to sketch it out in terms of like how you might build it and you put it all together. Now, all of this is very like do related, mm -hmm. right? You're gonna, right. You're gonna make, a, make a drawing of what it looks like and then you're gonna plan how to get the materials and you go get the materials. This is a to-do list, step by step by step, right? And then you're gonna use your hammer and your screwdriver and you're gonna put the thing together and then you're going to go out and test it. Did the thing that you built do the thing that you wanted it to do? And so often in engineering, we see this, this thing happen where we build a thing and we test the thing and we get some of that data back. Here's what I'm gonna change and here's what I'd rather, um, uh, and here's what I wanna keep. Here's how it did work. And we tend to like leap into exactly the next thing. Like now I'm gonna manufacture a thousand of them <laughs> and I'm gonna sell them for $25 a piece. And then that's how I'm gonna make my money, da, 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 da. And so what I'm suggesting is that there needs to be a pause in there. And so we do this, we do this sort of, sort of in engineering with a design review where we get everybody together and like, usually like the company pays for lunch, which feels like nice and like celebratory, right? Right. Like, right? That's not, I don't think that's an accident. Like at a design review, like, are we working? Yes, but we're also asking the question, how did the test go? What did the results say? You know, it's giving us the chance to pause and reflect in community, in collaboration with our team and say, where might we go from here? Do we need to go back around again because it didn't really work how we thought and we need to improve it? Or do we need to move on to the next thing? And did it uncover a new question? And now we have mm. to go like do something different. Asking those sorts of questions at a design review are part of this like rest, pause and reflect. Like when it's a design review, nobody works that day. Like they come to the meeting. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people, a lot of people complain about design reviews. A lot of people are like, I have to sit in the conference room all day. <laughs> you don't take enough, <laughs> you don't take enough breaks. Right. But they bought you donuts. So come on now. <laughs> but like, um, but it's important. And I wish we did it as an engineering community. I wish we did it just a little more intentionally, mm. a little more deliberately saying this design review is important because we are going to pause to reflect. And I wish we also incorporated more instead of just looking for all the flaws, which we tend to do at design reviews, mm -hmm. we added some celebration. What are we celebrating today? How far have we come? Like let's acknowledge each other. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, so that's super practical, like engineering, right? And so what I'm finding, like, as the CEO of my own company and now a team, you know, not more than a sol solopreneur, not that there's wrong, anything wrong with being a solopreneur, because I was that too, but like, as a CEO with a team leading people towards goals, it's hard, <laughs> it's hard to make space mm. and to hold the empty space and say, it's okay if we're not hyper productive right now that deadline can wait we need to take the time to have this conversation we need to take the time or even to you know we go through as a small business you know our business goes up and down our um you know our work our workflow goes up mm -hmm. and down like you know all of a sudden we have like six new contracts at once and then six months later there's like no new contracts <laughs> And two months after that, there's like six new contracts at once. And the, the, key, the key is, the trick is the, that two months where there were no contracts is not to panic. Mm -hmm. To say like, this is okay. Like, 
it's okay. Like sometimes we're crazy busy and we're all like working pedal to the metal and it's not healthy to work that way all the time. And I, I say to my employees all the time now as a CEO, like we are all humans here. And I feel that that is extremely different from, I'm patting myself on the neck. That's (laughs) extremely different from anything else I've ever experienced in the work world. And I am trying to be the change I would like to see. That's awesome. I am trying to be the change and say to my employees, we are all humans here and I need to take care of you as humans so that I can lead you as a work team. And if that means we need to make space for breaks and make space for reflection. That's part of my job. Again, as that catalyst, as that architect, as that big picture person to occasionally pull my people up out of the weeds and say, it's okay. Take a breath. Right. Take a breath. I've got you. We're all in this together. So that's kind of how it's manifesting for me right now. Like as a business leader, that like, and it is different and it is very, very difficult because we live in a society that says, do, 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 Mm -hmm. push, push, push. You should be like robots that have the same output all of the time. Yeah. Otherwise you're being useless and lazy and, you know, not getting enough stuff done, but not to, that's not taking into account the fact that actually when you rest and you have that time for reflection, your work, then when you start again, will be better. Okay. So personal example, because this is all like as above, so below as in technology, (laughs) so in business, so in personal life. Mm -hmm. So this morning, literally Mm -hmm. I I had been doing a daily yoga practice, like at the end of the summer and I've, I've totally lost the ball. I have totally lost the ball. I've I've been still running, but not so much with the yoga. And I, this, this morning I had an empty space on my Mm -hmm. schedule and I'm like, I am going to do yoga this morning. And I almost cried, (laughs) like I hit the mat and I was like, oh, my whole body was like, oh, thank you. And it's like, I have made this assumption that like, I'm okay, just output all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I needed the strength to make the space for myself. And as soon as I like got on the mat, my mind started to expand beyond my to-do list. And I started to have other ideas. And of course I'm telling my mind, no, 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 no. This is supposed to be like, we're supposed to be (laughs) present in the moment, in the body. This is not brainstorming time. But my, my mind had been so hungry for a moment of space (laughs) to let out all of these other ideas. And it couldn't get there. It couldn't get to the, it couldn't let the ideas out without the space created. And so like, I just think on a personal level, like the only way the ideas come out is by creating space for them. And that means stopping with the productivity all the time. No, that makes so much sense. I I mean, well, you know, there's that the old axiom where you, you get your best ideas in the shower, right? But I, I know pers- personally, like yes. that speaks to me on a, on a very personal level as well, because as an entrepreneur, you know, it, it's always kind of go, go, go. And it, I think it, it pays for people to recognize that they need that space. Like that's an actual need. It's not a like, oh, if I have time, oh, you know what I mean? Like that's just fluff on the, on the side. I won't have time for it. So I'm just going to skip it kind of thing. It's, it's a like, no, you, you gotta do it. <laughs> right. And, well, and to your point, right. That it, it actually makes you more productive. Like it's, yeah. it's so counterintuitive. It makes you more productive. It gives you better ideas. It makes you more efficient to stop and create that space. That's so true. That's so true. Um, and yeah, and, your, and your, the quality of your work will be better and the quality of your life will be better as well, which is cool, right? Because who wants to live a life where all you're doing is stressing and the minute that you get a, a second to stop, your mind just starts going, shh, 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 right? Exactly. <laughs> it's not fun. Who wants to be yeah. there? Right. Um, so let's talk about energy equity and community resilience. A, a lot of people, um, myself included, are not 
as educated as maybe we could be about that sort of thing, like what the inequalities are um, as far as, as energy is concerned. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, cool. So, so yeah, um, let's see, where to begin? <laughs> um, so I think, you know, we can all agree, right, that like we'd like to see more like renewable energy like out there in the world, right? We'd like to see more solar panels on roofs, you know, it makes you smile to see a wind farm, although some people think they're ugly. I don't think they're ugly. I think they're lovely. Smile to see yes. Um, you know, yeah. hydroelectric, you know, is a hydroelectric is an interesting one because it is renewable, but it also you have to like dam up a river, which right. causes yeah, some dis disruption, but it's still a renewable energy and it's not producing carbon. So, you know, yeah. there's some other cool stuff about geothermal using heat from the earth. There's some cool stuff. There's some really cool stuff, which actually does have some carbon emissions, but of using, using waste for, they call it biogas or biofuel. Okay. Uh -huh. And so using either livestock waste or even in certain situations, human waste at a wastewater treatment plant hmm. to ingest it into what they call a digester. And it basically converts the weight, solid waste into fuels that can be burned for electricity. What's beautiful about that, I think, um, carbon emissions aside, is that, um, you know, that waste is always going to flow. <laughs> like, yeah. we'll always, always have some of that. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's an unlimited fuel supply. And what a beautiful thing to transmute it into something useful. Um, and the carbon emissions, while they are there, because it is those are carbon-based fuels, um, are not are not as bad as you know some of the other um, like ancient fossil fuel stuff that we've right. that we've used in the past. Um, but anyway, I think we all agree, right, that renewable sources of energy generation are like we would love to see more of that in our communities. So the way that this has worked, sort of economically, in the past is. Um, the government will give a certain amount of incentives to um, put in renewable energy. A lot of those come in the form of tax benefits. There's an uh, investment tax credit, and then there's a, um, a form of depreciation that you can claim on your tax return um, that, you know, that you can depreciate the assets and you claim that as a credit. And then, and those, those credits, those tax credits are supposed to make the uh, the systems more economically viable. So basically, you know, if you, a very simple system, if you put solar on your roof, you're going to get a report from the solar company that says, here's when it should pay back. And that's based on your price of energy, because you're ge now generating your own kilowatt hours. You're not going to buy kilowatt hours from the utility. And so it, they're going to say like, well, you avoided buying this many kilowatt hours from the utility. So therefore you can afford to pay this much money for your solar panels. So that's one revenue stream for solar power mm -hmm. or any kind of uh, renewable generation. And then that doesn't, that often in, in a lot of places in the U.S. doesn't quite make the system pencil. It doesn't make it come out where you would want to put that, that money in. Mm -hmm. And so the government has said, okay, we want to invest in the advancement of renewable energy. So we're going to offer these tax credits. And now the combination of offsetting your utility bill and taking tax credits, now that's affordable. Like the total picture of the system is affordable. So there's a couple of issues with that. So first of all, in order to take those tax credits, you have to have a tax appetite, which means you have to have a pretty large tax bill because the credit only applies if you are paying that many, that much tax. Right. Right. So who's paying that, that many taxes? Wealthy people, right? Right. Also, if you don't have a tax appetite at all, if you're a nonprofit organization, or if you're a local municipal government organization, or if you're a tribal government, you don't have a tax appetite either. Right. And so you can't take those benefits. And so, there are issues of, and, you know, renewable energy is still, even though costs have come down over the years, renewable energy is still relatively expensive, especially capital. It's capital intensive. You need to make a big upfront payment, even if the system pays itself off over 15 years right. or 10 right. years or whatever. You have, to, you have to make the change. Right. You have to invest the capital upfront 
And of right. course, there are some other mechanisms to do this. There are some complicated uh, financial structures. Renewable energy projects work on the same financial structures as real estate transactions. So mm -hmm. there are some interesting, you know, financial games you can play with like third party owners who invest mm -hmm. in the project and then they, you know, they take the tax benefits and then but those aren't accessible to everyone. And so, you know, you putting this together in your head and you're saying who's losing out, right? Nonprofits who are serving underserved communities, um, you know, low income neighborhoods, you know, uh, apartment built multifamily housing in low income neighborhoods. Um, that's off, you know, often offering affordable housing through various government programs, HUD programs, and things like that. So that's the renewable energy issue. Right. But simultaneous to that, many, you know, just like I'm sure you've heard the story of like the interstate system that they they basically when they built interstates through cities, they basically just divided urban neighborhoods, and then mm -hmm. you ended up with um, degradation of those neighborhoods. Well power generation actually has a tendency to be the same. That in many circumstances, not all, not across the board, but power generation facilities tend to be located in lower income neighborhoods, right. multi-ethnic neighborhoods, immigrant neighborhoods. Yeah. And these are fossil fuel burning plants. And so the air quality in those neighborhoods is demonstrably worse right. than air quality in wealthier neighborhoods that exist down massive transmission feeders away from the generation plant. And so there are multiple issues when it comes to equity, you know, and then, then we get to the issue of community resilience. And so, you know, we talked a little bit about when I was explaining what a microgrid is, that one of the benefits of microgrids is that it allows your facility to stay up when the grid goes down. Mm -hmm. But all of those previous issues we just talked about still apply that like, it's expensive, it's capital intensive, it, you have to have a tax appetite, all of this other stuff that like makes it difficult to put resilient systems in these vulnerable neighborhoods around vulnerable populations where community is really key. Like, the, right. like in times of disaster, in times of crisis, those communities pull together to help each other, support each other, and they rely on infrastructure to help them. You know, it's, we're only as strong as our most vulnerable populations. And these right. are the most vulnerable. And so that's another avenue, you know, so we're talking about air quality for these underserved communities. We are talking about just access to clean energy in general, regardless of their local air quality, but just like the privilege of having renewables <laughs> And knowing that you are supporting the planet and you have re reliable access to electricity. Um, and then third is this community resilience piece, which in a lot of ways is way more important for these vulnerable populations, these vulnerable community, underserved communities than it is for a you know, wealthier community where you can afford a generator that's connected to your house and you make your own house a microgrid. Right. Um, and so that's, that's the idea. It, it's, it's so intersectional, these issues, you know, that like, wow, yeah. we can do something that supports the planet and supports humans and cleans up our air quality and provides these communities a beautiful place to gather when things are hitting the fan. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. So that's things amazing. that are, things that uh, resilient facilities can provide to these communities are access to ice and clean water okay. during a crisis. Wow. If, like, wow. if their power stays up when the grid goes down, mm -hmm. access to ice and water, access to showers, bathing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, flushing toilets. <laughs> um, so, you know, most city water, you know, works, but like, we, you know, we're on a well here, um, but um, certainly hot water and showers. Um, obviously food service can be a big mm -hmm. deal for a resilient facility to provide food service for a community um, and like food kind of food bank, like food refrigeration. So like you can just come pick up food during a crisis situation. It provides a place for people to go and get communications. They can charge their cell phone. Mm. They can, they might be able to get on Wi-Fi. maybe like if this plate, it depends on the health of the 
wider communications network. But maybe they weren't able to connect to something at home, but they can connect here because the power is on. Um, and so, and, and potentially even not all resilience hubs supply like overnight, like lodging, a safe right. place to shelter, but sometimes they do. Yeah. Um, and we've seen that with like hurricanes and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I mean, we're also working uh, or we're, we're applying to work with National Guard bases because National Guard provi often provides disaster response services. Right. And right. so it's like the National Guard base where they all gather and muster and collect supplies. Yeah, the power needs to be on there. <laughs> serve their communities right yeah. and so so those are the facets those are the facets of the links sort of between equity community resilience and how energy comes in and serves those needs is there a way for anybody listening who's interested in helping or anybody just to help like what is something people can do to aid this whole thing <laughs> well, okay, the whole, all of the things. Okay, so, all of the things. Okay, so if you're interested in clean energy and you want to understand like more about what technology is out there and mm -hmm. like kind of what the issues are, I would love for you to come listen to the PowerFlow podcast. We're at powerflowpodcast.com or wherever you listen to podcasts on all of the major platforms because we really are talking about these all of these issues and it's a good way to just kind of dip your toe into the water of like, what's going on? Like, it's right. a lot more than just solar panels on a roof. There's a lot more. And, you know, if, have you been thinking about getting an electric vehicle, but you're like, I don't know, will I, you know, what's the range? Will I run out of power? Where will I charge it? Come listen to the podcast, you know, come, come learn about EV technologies that are out there. Um, and we, we nerd out a lot. So if you like, if you like nerdiness and you like nerdy puns, you know, there's a lot of that too. If you want to learn more about community resilience, there's really, there's a really cool organization called the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. It's USDN. I think they're usdn.org, but I can't, I can't be, they're a, they're a consortium of sustainability directors in municipalities, like small okay. mid-sized cities. And we've worked with USDN to put together a document about what a resilience hub actually is and how it serves the needs of uh, the community from the social justice standpoint and from like cold, hard, technical, like electrons flowing standpoint. <laughs> um, because there's, there's, resilient community resilience is a really interesting concept that has yeah. some some really cool technology behind it but it also is massively psychology as well because it's about supporting humans during crisis and so there are lots of different organizations I, you know i'm pointing you to usdn because they've done a wonderful job of putting together what it's what it means sort of from the technical side mm -hmm. There are lots of other organizations out there, however, working on community resilience from more of a, um, let's call it a humanitarian side, you know, a social side, mm -hmm. as opposed to the technical side. And what I would love to see, and I think we are seeing is those two sides coming more and more together and mm -hmm. saying, you can't, you can't just say the lights are on and say that's <laughs> enough. Like there has to be this other like, we're caring for people, we're caring for humans during crisis at the same time. But you also just can't come give everyone hugs. Like you need to have the lights on as well. And so, you know, bringing those two things together mm -hmm. to com a complete definition of community resilience is important. So I'd start with USDN, check out the paper on what a resilience hub is. And, um, and you know, I say start local. You know, if you really wanna get involved, start looking around at your own communities or your nearest big city. And maybe you connect with a sustainability manager or an emergency manager and say, hey, like what's going on? What can I do? Um, there's a, you know, even connecting to your state level representatives, like our federal representatives who are working like in Washington DC are great, but most of this kind of stuff happens at our state level and your state represent level representatives, like, I find that the state level representatives are much less like partisan and like political and posturing. And they're more dedicated to just getting stuff done for right, you. Like the actual people that are actually living right. in the communities they represent. Yes. 
<laughs> and wait, and, right. and they're actually saying like, like, school needs to go forward how are we going to do that people you know and so getting involved like with your state reps you know even as simple as contacting them writing letters and telling them your concern telling them this is important to you mm -hmm. is a huge step but then starting to find out like what's going on in your community in terms of renewable energy in terms of community resilience planning um is a great way to start right like any other problem it starts with awareness right like that's right. There's just that's lots right. of things that people, the general populace is completely unaware of that would help if they knew about. I often say that like energy is this weird intersection of something that's like very technologically complex, but mm -hmm. normal people touch it every single day and we don't even think about it. Right. And so just learning a little bit. Oh, one, of, one thing I always recommend to people is like take, sit down with your electric bill and see how you're actually charged for your energy like don't hmm. just don't just like open the electric bill and pay it and then put it away right like actually take a look there's a chart on there at the very least you know you can have all sorts of complexity on your electric bill but at the very least there's a chart on there that shows your usage over each of the last 12 months and it usually has like for example if you get your bill now it's, it's, if you get your bill now mid-October, you're getting your September bill. It'll show you September, 2021, and then it'll show you what your usage was in September, 2020. Did your usage go up mm. or did it go down? Can you challenge yourself to make your October usage less than October, 2020? And like, start thinking about how I use power, you know, during the energy crisis of the 1970s there was a huge campaign to like go around and turn all your lights off and make sure you like and we kind of have lost that a little bit there were a lot of psas i recall when i was a child that were like turn the lights off when you leave right. a room right yes yeah. yeah and we've kind of we've kind of lost that we kind of assume that like yeah. like all yeah. oh, the power is there like that's okay and like just that like you said awareness mm -hmm. of kind of like your own usage patterns, like what's important to you. Um, right. What, what you really, when you're really consuming energy, when you really need it versus when it's like, eh, you know, um, just some of that awareness and there's no judgment about that. No, but like no. just the, just the fact of thinking about it is a huge step. Yeah, totally. No, it's funny. You, I, I always hear, um, you hear people say like, oh, I don't need to know how the electricity works in order to use it. Or I don't know how, how, have no have to have to know how a car works in order to drive it it's like but maybe you should right <laughs> right does it make you happy to not know i don't maybe sometimes sometimes <laughs> but like um yeah and yeah even, even if you don't understand everything about how it works like just again that awareness and being able to say like yeah i know where it comes from i don't know how yeah. it all works but like i know that my state uses you know whatever it is 60% natural gas and, you know, 20% coal and 20% renewables. Like, right. you know, I, yeah. I just pulled those numbers out. That is not necessarily <laughs> my state. I just, you know, yeah, just a few little like insights like that might make you start to think about it a little right. bit more. Right. Become more responsible for it. I am so sorry. We have gone so, I, I've been so lost in this conversation. We've, we've actually taken an hour at this point. So I'm going to let you go. <laughs> Okay, no worries. I often joke that like I can't talk for less than 20 minutes. So it's no, it's this is totally cool. Good. Oh, okay. I'm glad. I'm glad. I hope I didn't uh, keep you from anything. This has been so much fun, Amy. This is so this is so great. I'd love to have you back sometime too. Awesome. Yeah, let's do it. Put all the information about the podcast and everything. I'll put put that all in the comment section too. Sounds great. Thank you so much. All right. All right, everybody. Remember, everyone has a story to tell. What's yours?